ghosts who refuse to graduate. Join us as we enroll at the nation's most haunted campuses and take a tour of the prestigious Notre Dame University, where a famous football legend is sick of the spotlight. He's bad. He's real bad. He'll, he'll scare you to make you want to run out of the building. And in New England, a student killed herself in her dorm room. Fifty years later, she's still searching for a roommate. As the story goes, she left in the middle of the night, raving, seal it, seal it, rip down the walls. And in this Florida art school, students need more than their room key to keep this spirit out. You see a skeletal figure floating in the air above you, that's pretty scary. Come along as we visit the country's most studious specters, where higher education has never reached such terrifying heights. College can be a pretty scary affair. New people to meet, teachers to impress, and all that academic pressure. You spend so much time worrying about what you want to do when you grow up. But choose a campus haunted by ghosts, and you can forget about the books. Instead, you'll find yourself with a double major in life and death. The University of Notre Dame is a school full of history and tradition. And football is as much a part of Notre Dame as its books and basilica. Every Notre Dame football fan swells with pride when they hear these legendary five words. Win one for the Gipper. Win one for the Gipper. And win one for the Gipper. The Gipper was Notre Dame football star George Gipp, who in 1920 died after a bout with pneumonia. On his deathbed, the 25-year-old Gipper told his coach, Newt Rockney, his one and only dying wish. When the boys are up against it, when the brakes are not going their way, you tell them to go out and give their all and win one for the Gipper. And I don't know where I'll be, Rock, but I'll know and I'll be happy. Eight years after the Gipper's death, things were looking bleak for Notre Dame during a game against their arch rival, Army. For the first time, Coach Rockney spoke those famous words. He told them, this is that day and you are that team. And they went out and they won the game. Notre Dame beat Army that day 12 to 6, solidifying the Gipper's legend at Notre Dame. And 90 years later, his name still echoes through the school's halls. Only this time, his legend has nothing to do with football. He's, he's bad. He's real bad. He'll, he'll scare you to make you want to run out of the building. Notre Dame is located in South Bend, Indiana, and was founded by Catholic priests in 1842. Today, the campus has grown from five buildings to 136, with a new athletic facility soon to come. But legend tells us that the brotherhood that built Notre Dame had more in mind than just creating a beautiful campus. The buildings are grouped based on theories of sacred geometry. The ancient churches of Europe usually were astronomically oriented and there is what is called an Apollo Saint Michael line that goes all across Europe into Asia, Asia Minor that, that comes very close to what we have here. Like the pyramids in Egypt and Stonehenge in England, the location of the campus is meant to harness a divine power. Is there energy there? All you have to do is just take a dowsing rod and you can feel it and know it and see it on occasion. Students and visitors feel it when they come here. They can't explain why, but they feel it. And there's one building on campus that sits on the hot spot of this energy. The energy line here goes right through the high altar of, of our basilica. And in the last two years, we've had two levitations I know of.
Students at Notre Dame know their college experience will be like no other, but most have no idea of the powers their campus really holds. I'm positive that the builders, the early community, knew of this energy. They were creating something on Earth that, in the best of their ability, reflects God's designs. This mystique attracts 8,000 undergrads and 3,000 grad students, most of whom find it hard not to get caught up in Notre Dame school spirit. It's incredible. Inside the locker room, you know, there's plaques of all the Heisman Trophy winners, and you're surrounded by history everywhere you turn. It's hard to put into words, but when you're on that field for the first time and you kind of, you know, hear the crowd, you know, cheering as you come run out of the tunnel, uh, it's just an unbelievable experience. At Notre Dame, some say football is like a religion, and George Gipp is their god. Gipper was notorious, great football player, notorious for uh, his escapades in town uh, in the evenings. Well, he was a very uh, interesting individual, is the way I would put it. He, uh, he was kind of a laid-back guy. He was almost shy, but yet he enjoyed uh, playing poker. He enjoyed shooting pool. He enjoyed the good life. I'm sure he had a few drinks from time to time. Legend says George Gipp's wild streak would soon cut his career and life short. And he came back after curfew one night, so he couldn't get in. And he slept out on the steps, and it was really cold and rainy, so he caught pneumonia, and he died. So that's why they say that he haunts this place. Students passing Washington Hall late at night walk a little faster. But those who work there have no choice but to face its haunting past. And one employee had an encounter she'll never forget. The lights were off other than the um, ghost light on the stage. And he come up onto the stage in front of me. And I reached out and I put my hand through. Locked out in life, it seems the Gipper isn't leaving in death. It was just a weird, creepy feeling. And then you felt the cold draft. And then he left. While night staff are used to his presence, about 20 years ago, a group of theater students wanted to put the legend of the Gipper to the test. In 1986, a group of students came back in the building after hours and used a Ouija board and asked it um, about the ghost. The night started off all in good fun until a cryptic message began to appear. And they repeatedly kept saying SG and telling them goodbye. The students left frightened and confused, but it didn't take long for them to figure it out. When they left, they saw a light come on in the green room from outside, and they looked back at the building and a security guard came outside. And so they knew that the ghost was kind of telling them to get out of the building. It seems the Gipper was warning the students that they were about to get caught by security, and they got away just in time. Today, a group of Notre Dame students wants to recreate history, hoping to summon the spirit of George Gipp and prove that the strange noises they hear in the middle of the night aren't so strange after all. I just thought it would be really neat just to see if there really are any ghosts here because there's always like really eerie feelings around here in certain areas and um, there's so many stories. But do these students know what they're in for? I kind of want something major to happen but then at the same time I don't. I don't want to be a little scary but I hope we find something. I have no idea what's going to happen tonight um, but I think that it's going to be exciting and I think that it's going to be a something that we're either going to totally feel or not at all. Okay, well, everyone needs to put their fingers on there, just lightly, though. You don't want to put a lot of pressure on there. And we'll see if we can contact anybody. Okay. Are there any spirits here that want to talk to us? Will you tell us your name? anywhere else on campus? No. Did you die here? Yes. How did you die? F. R. O. Z. We froze.
Was it the ghost of George Gipp? Perhaps Notre Dame's divine energy? Or just a student's overactive imagination? There's so much about Notre Dame that's storytelling, and that's what all the other stories about too, wanting to be back at Notre Dame, wanting to be here for you know another semester, another year, another four years. Like so many of Notre Dame's students, it seems the Gipper just wasn't ready to graduate. Coming up, at this Midwestern University, even the most studious students avoid the library late at night. It's sort of hard because I was a skeptic, and the only thing that made me believe was actually seeing it. And up next, students at this Massachusetts college should think twice before answering a late night phone call. It just might be a dead connection. There's someone called the Whispering Woman. What she does is she calls at four and five in the morning and will just say, hello, 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 in this really freaky voice. Coming up, the shroud of night hides the deepest, darkest secrets. The quaint town of South Hadley, Massachusetts, sits the nation's oldest continuing institution for higher learning for women. It's called Mount Holyoke College, and while today young women from all over the world are dying to get into this competitive liberal arts school, there are some who have died and can't get out. Founded by educator Mary Lyon in 1837, Mount Holyoke's 2,000 students continue to hold on to the traditions of its founder. From the athletic complex to our classrooms and student center, there's just, there's so much to rave about. It's just a great place to live and study. The traditions have stayed for so long and there are so many because it was founded in 1837 and at that time it was the first women's college anywhere in the U.S. and they've just kept going with the whole sisterhood bond and keeping the community together. The all women's atmosphere is incredible. It's, it's, it's an atmosphere unlike I've, I've ever experienced. It's, it's an intensely complex support network. But when it comes to ghosts at Mount Holyoke, students can't say they haven't been warned. I remember the very first orientation, they were like, okay, here you are, you're gonna hear ghost stories, there are lots of ghost stories. They were like, if you're scared, leave, you know, because like, these are scary ghost stories. Many of the ghost stories are attributed to the body buried in the center of campus. It is the grave of the college founder, Miss Mary Lyon. As a presence on campus, she is quite, uh, you know, present. She is absolutely here. Mary Lyon founded this school in 1837, and it, it was a labor of love. Mary Lyon was a huge advocate for women's higher education, and even today, all who say her name do so with a great appreciation of her efforts. But there was one person at Mount Holyoke who didn't share the admiration. Rumor has it that Mary Lyon and the school's religious clergyman, Deacon Porter, were having an illicit affair. Deacon Porter uh, was a good friend of Mary Lyon, and some would say perhaps too good of a friend. Today, a picture of the deacon's wife, Mrs. Hannah Porter, still hangs on campus. And some students swear the portrait is possessed. Hannah Porter's portrait is, in fact, um, very somber. And apparently, the look she takes on during finals time um, is very disapproving. Uh, many students perceive this as her, her final vengeance against Mary Lyon for the affair she perceived between our founder and Deacon Porter. But a creepy painting isn't the only remnant of the past that comes alive at Mount Holyoke. Mary Lyon herself makes her presence known. And while she isn't necessarily menacing, there is one spot on campus where students and staff don't like to go. I live on the fourth floor of Wilder. I would say it is haunted, what do you think? Definitely. Yes, it's really haunted. Students assigned to the fourth floor say they've seen firsthand that Mount Holyoke's ghost stories aren't stories at all. My roommate was asleep in her room and I had just gone to bed in my room and it was probably about 1.30 in the morning. 
all of a sudden I hear footsteps walking. So I think, okay, it's my roommate, Hana. She's up, you know, walking around. I hear the footsteps come in my room, come over to my bed. I'm sleeping on my side with my eyes closed the entire time. And so the footsteps come over, they stop at the edge of my bed. And I feel like somebody's just looking at me, just kind of check to see if I'm asleep or not. And I feel an arm come out and sort of like go to grab my arm. Was it Mary Lyon checking up on her students? Or was another of Mount Holyoke's many spirits reaching out from beyond? There are legends of a stressed out student committing suicide. They'll, they'll hear someone crying, saying, help me, and, or you'll see someone hanging underneath the bridge. And stories of a mysterious whispering woman. There's someone called the Whispering Woman. What she does is she calls at 4 and 5 in the morning and will just say, hello, 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 in this really freaky voice. One day I just received like six phone calls in the span of an hour. I was totally freaked out, so I'm calling the public, <laughs> public safety. <laughs> like, somebody's calling me, and they're like, oh, it's the Whispering Woman. Like, she's starting early this year. <laughs> There's even rumors of murder victims still seeking to tell their tales. The story that goes along with that is that there was a young woman who um, got locked in the closet and like tried to scratch her way out and ended up dying in this closet. But then there was also the feeling from the bathroom of that, you know, something horrible had happened in there. Sometimes when I'm brushing my teeth late at night, I can feel something disturbing around me. It's just really unpleasant. There are so many ghost stories at Mount Holyoke, it is hard to tell which ones are based in truth and which ones are just urban legend. But there's one ghost that even skeptical students can't deny. She's a foggy form roaming the fourth floor. Students believe this spirit is that of a former student who killed herself in a room after she was stood up by a boy. Today, the room where she hung herself is off limits to all. For a long time, it was reported that students who were rooming in the, the room had their legs broken routinely. Fact or fiction, no one wanted to take a chance. The room was boarded up. But when a housing crisis hit the college in the 80s, the dean contemplated reopening the room. But only after staying the night in it herself to prove the rumors were nothing more than urban legend. So she attempted to spend the night there to disprove the myth to the Mount Holyoke students because nobody was, wanted to live there. And um, as the story goes, she left in the middle of the night um, raving, seal it, seal it, rip down the walls. No one knows exactly what happened that night. The dean never uttered a word. I'm sure you've heard the room in Wilder is close it off. So it still is closed off. I mean, maybe there's a problem. But it seems like at Mount Holyoke, when one room is boarded up, the ghost of the white lady just moves to another. So this is a room where um, social functions are held to this day, and the woman in white frequently makes appearances at them. But even students who've never seen a ghost know that the supernatural is just part of the Mount Holyoke experience. In all honesty, I'd probably freak out and go to another room and maybe call, like, residential life and be like, my room's haunted, hon. We need to fix this. And while the late night moans and creaks echoing through the campus can be terrifying, at least students in this sleepy Massachusetts town have something to talk about the next day. Maybe we're more sensitive, more intuitive. I think that is definitely part of it. And we like to talk and giggle and scream. And at Mount Holyoke, telling stories is a way of keeping their rich tradition alive. And perhaps a way of accepting that at this school, the dead just might be walking among the living. It's exciting it in is a, a yeah. weird way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's kind of like a creepy movie. Coming up, at a New Hampshire college, a teacher reaches out from beyond to keep her students in line. Just chills, you know, all through my body, and like, it was so scary. Up next, students living in the dorms of this Florida art school are plagued by the spirit of its seedy past. You see a skeletal figure floating in the air above you, that's pretty scary. No parents, no curfews the perfect chance to try something new. 
But on a haunted campus, an encounter with the unknown can turn ghostly and will send you running scared right back to mom and dad. Welcome to Sarasota, Florida, home of warm beaches, bikinis, and the circus. Believe it or not, the vacation destination of Sarasota owes much of its history to the Ringling Brothers Circus. But it's another Ringling building whose history is far more bizarre than the Big Top. Ringling School of Art and Design attracts an eclectic mix of art students. These creative types can major in computer animation, graphic and web design, illustration, photography, and much more. But you won't find hauntings listed in the course book. It seems at Ringling, ghost sightings are strictly extracurricular. You see a skeletal figure floating in the air above you, that's pretty scary. I didn't believe it until I saw that, saw her that night. It's kind of a, an eye-catching experience and a life-changing experience. Ringling's resident ghost dates back to the 1920s. Students call her Mary, and many believe life wasn't kind to this depressed and aging prostitute. That's actually a picture I took in the hallway of um, what I believe could be Mary. I don't know what it was. It was scary, whatever it was. Call it what you will. Maybe I was, you know, hallucinating, maybe I was dreaming, but I don't know. I heard a lot of ghost stories from here, and this close to the room where it happened, uh, I don't know what to think. So how did a prostitute's apartment become an art school? It all started when circus celebrity John Ringling came to town with dreams of building a school of art and design. He not only was interested, obviously, in the circus, but he's also very interested in art. And so he collected art, and his dream was actually to build a museum, a major museum, and have an art school that would be part of that museum. In the late 1920s, Ringling bought an old hotel. He soon converted the hotel into Ringling School of Art and Design's first campus building. Little did he know, the building's unsavory past would find a way of catching up with the present. Legend has it the hotel was home to the seedier side of Sarasota, and it was here where Mary lived and worked. While the city's wealthy residents were enjoying the last days before the Great Depression, Mary was in a depression of her own. A life in the shadows was too much for her to handle. On a fateful night, Mary decided she couldn't take another day of her meaningless existence. She hung herself in the staircase between the second and third floor of the building. But Mary's story wasn't over. In fact, it was only just beginning. <laughs> Today, the old hotel is a dormitory known as the Keating Center Residence Hall. Many believe the lady in white has never left her former home. The stories of Mary are legendary. We've heard stories over and over again from various students who have experienced the ghost of Mary, if you will, in our Keating Center, which has been a residence hall for 75 years almost. The hall's recurring resident has made her presence known to generations of students at Ringling. Well, I started Ringling in the fall of 1985, and I was a fine arts major and lived in the dorms, what's now Keating Hall. I noticed some funny things starting to happen in my room. I'd leave and turn the lights out, and when i come back on, the lights would be on. I had a scarf that was just sort of draped over a doorknob, and it was all of a sudden tied around the door one time. So just little kind of creepy things that I would notice that would, would make me a little bit nervous. But on one fateful night, Mary went from a playful prankster to a terrifying specter. I woke up and opened my eyes and there was this ghostly figure hovering in the far corner of my room. She closed her eyes hoping it was a dream, but when she opened them again, Mary was still there. And I said, Mary, go, you, know, you, don't, you don't live here, you're not welcome here. Mary vanished 
Just as a concerned neighbor who heard screams ran in. And then I told her what had happened, and she said that she had, she had had encounters with her, too, in her room. Mary's hovering act has also made its way outside the walls of Keating. My friend and I, Todd, were talking and walking towards the Keating Hall. It was two in the morning, and the entire campus seemed dead to the world. But one resident was a little more dead than the rest. I stopped, and my friend wasn't paying attention to what was in front. He was paying attention to me. And then he turned around and looked at me and said, what are you looking at? On the very top floor was a girl standing in the window. It didn't seem right, because the girl was dressed in more of an early 1900s, late 1800s long dress, but it was, wasn't quite right. Right before their eyes, the shadowy figure jumped. And we ran over to where the bushes were, to where she would have fallen, and there was nothing there. It was just, just an ominous, eerie sight. Is Mary's spirit teaching the students of Ringling a lesson in fear? Or is she simply a wayward soul too depressed to graduate to a place of even higher learning? For some, it's a terrifying visit from the other side. For others, it's just another part of the frightening and mysterious experience that is college. Coming up, roommates sleep with their lights on in this New Hampshire dormitory. You know, all through my body, and like it was so scary. Up next, when a historic college building was destroyed, a terrifying specter from its past rose from the ashes. We've looked at that photograph and thought to ourselves that was Abraham Lincoln's spirit. The hardest part about a first hand experience with a ghost isn't surviving it, it's trying to go on with your life. They'll soon see this college has a history that is far from normal. Once a small teaching school, the campus is now home to some 20,000 students from across the globe. The first building of what was then called Illinois State Normal University opened on the campus in 1861. Known as Old Main, the domed building would be a landmark for almost 100 years. In 1946, the um, dome and the third floor had to be removed because they were deemed to be unsafe. And then in 1958, the rest of Old Main had to be torn down. But closing the earliest chapter of the university's history would only reopen its past. And some say, awaken dormant spirits within. Nelson Smith, the school's photographer, was on hand for the demolition and took dozens of pictures, one of which would prove truly unforgettable. When he was looking at the negatives, realized that he had caught an instant in which the collapsing bricks, mortar, dust, and everything had formed the shape of uh, a silhouette of Abraham Lincoln's face. The resemblance is eerie. But what does Abraham Lincoln have to do with Old Main? Because he was the person who drew up the papers, he was the attorney for the university, we've looked at that photograph and thought to ourselves that was Abraham Lincoln's spirit perhaps manifesting itself at this moment that the original building on campus was demolished. Abraham Lincoln may be the most famous fright to appear out of thin air at ISU but he is certainly not the most infamous. That distinction goes to another alleged apparition, one that continues to make its presence felt among students and faculty. I was terrified of the stacks. It's got a presence, I said, I guess. The stacks are located in ISU's Milner Library, named after its ghostly former librarian, Angie Milner. We're standing in front of Milner Library that was built in 1940. This is the building that was named for Angie Milner. She was our first full-time paid librarian at Illinois State Normal University. And this is the place where she is said to haunt the stacks. And while
While a ghostly librarian may not seem scary, students studying in the library late at night make sure they are not alone. It's sort of hard because I was a skeptic and the only thing that made me believe was actually seeing it. By day, the stacks seem harmless. But at night, students and employees have heard strange footsteps. Books are moved from shelf to shelf. And most frightening of all, a chilling shush from the ghost of the late librarian. This is the hallway here where Sarah saw the ghost of Angie Milner. And that's also the direction from which the sound of the footsteps was coming. I have had several experiences feeling Angie Milner's presence when I've been in the library. Is the ghost of Angie Milner lurking in the cramped shadows of the library? And if so, why? As the school's first librarian, Angie Milner built and organized the library's collection from scratch. This library was cataloged in her own handwriting for probably the first 10 years that the library existed. It was Angie's hands-on approach that helps explain her lingering devotion to her work. This is one of the books from the section that she was finished, had just finished cataloging when she, when she passed away. And this here at the bottom is her handwriting. Angie Milner was more than just a librarian. She embodied the spirit of a school. Known for her dedication, hard work, and community spirit, she never retired from her position, working up until the day before she passed away. That was Friday the 13th, 1928. The entire university was closed for her on-campus funeral. She was very attached to the books. She felt uh, personal ownership of those books, and she took excellent care of them. One day before her death, Angie Milner was cataloging and shelving biology books. These books, more than any others, seemed to have a mind of their own. Over in the back section of the stacks, uh, the librarian and one of her colleagues were, they were discussing about moving the books to a different location. And at that point, the books started falling off one by one. But even more disconcerting than how the books fell off the shelves is how they landed. The book usually lands like that. And if you try to do that by just pulling a book off of the shelf, especially from this height, it won't do it. You can't do it. It always falls over. Books aren't the only objects the ghost is reported to move at will. Before every Halloween, the librarians at Illinois State University bring tours into the haunted stacks. On this particular night, they got something else entirely, a genuine scare. A chair reserved for Angie's section of the stacks was seen quickly moving down the length of the aisle, as if someone or something was moving it. If you try to roll the chair, give it a push, hardest push as you want, it always goes to the left. It won't ever go straight. But in this particular instance, it went all the way down the entire aisle. Recently, students doing a research paper on Angie's ghost brought a medium with them to try to contact her. And we found one spot, kind of in like the middle aisle, and we stood there and we were pretty sure that she was across from us. After making contact, Angie's spirit asked why they were there. But before the medium could answer, one student saw Angie appear and disappear before her very eyes. It just sort of appeared in the aisle and just sort of went through the books. Then she was gone. 
It may be for the best that Illinois State University dropped the word normal from its name. And while the idyllic campus is certainly a nice place to visit, just be sure to return your library books on time. The librarians at ISU are dead serious about their work. And up next, it's known as New England's biggest party school, but a good time isn't to blame for keeping students in this dorm up all night. Stick around if you dare. New Hampshire is a postcard-perfect New England town. But in Keene, things aren't always as they seem. Located in the southwest corner of the state, the city of Keene embodies small town living at its finest. It's like a quintessential New England town. The city is home to Keene State College. Much like the city itself, Keene State College is a friendly, tight-knit community. The campus is really nice because it's small enough, but it's big enough. You know everybody. Everybody knows everybody. It's kind of nice. A um, little over 5,000 kids. It's a good time. It really is. When they're not studying, Keene State students like to have a good time. Actually, Playboy called us the number one party school. Yeah. So, we're professional partiers. That's what Playboy called us. Our students have external influences on them for the first time, whether it's mom and dad not looking over their shoulders or new lives to lead. But our, our students are just like any other students anywhere else in the country. The students of Keene State College, however, might disagree. They say other students don't have to worry about pressures from the paranormal. I would say that there's some pretty restless spirits around campus. I'm not really concretely you know, sure about what they are or what their business is, but I'm pretty sure that there's things going on here that aren't normal. Legends of ghosts at Keene State College have passed from one generation of students to the next. But it's the first-hand experiences that keep the stories of the dead alive. Basically, just chills you know, all through my body, and like it was so scary. When I was up there, a couple of the lights were flickering. <laughs> it's just, it's really dark. It's very creepy. Of all the spirits rumored to be enrolled at Keene State, there is one that everyone knows about. Harriet Huntress. Harriet Huntress. Harriet Huntress. We just call her Harriet now. Like, we just kind of are like, oh, it's just Harriet. <laughs> the legend of Harriet Huntress dates back to the school's humble beginnings around the turn of the century. Harriet Huntress was, uh, was pretty special in the world of education. Uh, students were her focus. Uh, she uh, did whatever she could to make, uh, in particular, their quality of life better. Harriet worked for the Board of Education and was known as a devoted educator. She passionately fought for underprivileged students and raised funds so no student at Keene State College would be denied an education. The story goes that in 1918 she became afflicted with a mysterious illness and was bound to a wheelchair. But that didn't stop her tireless dedication to the school. Many say before she died, Harriet left a large sum of money to student scholarships. After her death, the school named a residence hall after Harriet. Huntress Hall sits on the Keene State Quad in the heart of the campus. And according to legend, Harriet's ghost has returned to Keene State, keeping a watchful eye on students who reside in her namesake hall. Huntress Hall had always been an all-female uh, dormitory, but during World War II, we started to have uh, naval air cadets coming in uh, to stay and to study while they were being trained at the airport outside of town. The all-female dorm was split in two to house the air cadets. They say that's when the problem started. We've been told many times that the, uh, that the young ladies that lived in Huntress were uh, trying to get through the barriers to the men's side and vice versa. And when that happened, Harriet was upset. And the noises started. According 
According to students at Keene State, the noises haven't stopped. And most are traced back to the attic where Harriet's original wheelchair is kept. Soon after she died, it was put away for storage. But some say Harriet's spirit is still attached. And the dark corners of the attic are where she roams. One night, I was just sitting in my room with my roommate. And we heard, like, shuffling right above me, actually. And I turned around to look at her. I was like, did you hear that? She was like, yeah. Trying to calm her nerves, she jokingly knocked on the ceiling, as if to complain to her inconsiderate upstairs neighbors. But all laughing stopped when something from the empty attic above knocked back. And it wasn't an echo, like we've done it before, like I've done it since, I mean, and there's been no echo or anything. And so we've been really scared ever since, basically. There are other strange sounds coming from the empty attic that keep students from getting a good night's sleep. Around like three o'clock, um, you'll hear it go back and forth. Um, like you can hear the wheelchair going, moving. Um, like it sounds like wheels. That's what it sounds like, it doesn't sounds it? It really sounds like, like wheels like. strolling over, like just rolling down the aisle. Is the ghost of Harriet Huntress eternally making sure her students stay in line? I don't know. I, I, I guess it's. I guess Harriet's still around for some unfinished business. I guess. The Harriet story is very well known, and I think that the, the stories aren't going to go away anytime soon. College students with uh, active young minds are fascinated by the unusual, whether they're. Uh, stories of aliens or ghosts or maybe just their science lessons. Could these active young minds be imagining the existence of Harriet? Or might her presence be one of those things that science cannot explain? While students at Keene State College have no scientific proof of a ghost, those who have seen her have no doubt she's there. Survive four years in a haunted college, and you'll leave school with more than just a diploma. All it takes is one extracurricular encounter to convince even the most bookish student that there's more to life and death than can be taught in a classroom. students at Keene State, the noises haven't stopped. And most are traced back to the attic where Harriet's original wheelchair is kept. Soon after she died, it was put away for storage. But some say Harriet's spirit is still attached. And the dark corners of the attic are where she roams. One night, I was just sitting in my room with my roommate and we heard like shuffling right above me actually and I turned around to look at her I was like did you hear that she's like yeah trying to calm her nerves she jokingly knocked on the ceiling as if to complain to her inconsiderate upstairs neighbors but all laughing stopped when something from the empty attic above knocked back and it wasn't an echo like we've done it before like I've done it since I mean and there's been no echo or anything and so we've been really scared ever since basically there are other strange sounds coming from the empty attic that keep students from getting a good night's sleep around like three o'clock um you'll hear it go back and forth um like you can hear the wheelchair going moving um like it sounds like wheels that's what it sounds like doesn't <laughs> it sounds it? Like it sounds like wheels like. strolling over like just rolling down the aisle He not only was interested, obviously, in the circus, but he's also very interested in art. And so he collected art, and his dream was actually to build a museum, a major museum, and have an art school that would be part of that museum. In the late 1920s, Ringling bought an old hotel. He soon converted the hotel into Ringling School of Art and Design's first campus building. Little did he know, the building's unsavory past would find a way of catching up with the present. 
Legend has it the hotel was home to the seedier side of Sarasota, and it was here where Mary lived and worked. While the city's wealthy residents were enjoying the last days before the Great Depression, Mary was in a depression of her own. A life in the shadows was too much for her to handle. On a fateful night, Mary decided she couldn't take another day of her meaningless existence. She hung herself in the staircase between the second and third floor of the building. But Mary's story wasn't over. In fact, it was only just beginning. <laughs> Today, the old hotel is a dormitory known as the Keating Center Residence Hall. Many believe the lady in white has never left her former home. I mean, seal it, seal it, rip down the walls. No one knows exactly what happened that night. The dean never uttered a word. I'm sure you've heard the room in Wilder is closed off. So it still is closed off. I mean, maybe there's a problem. But it seems like at Mount Holyoke, when one room is boarded up, the ghost of the white lady just moves to another. So this is a room where um, social functions are held to this day, and the woman in white frequently makes appearances at them. But even students who've never seen a ghost know that the supernatural is just part of the Mount Holyoke experience. In all honesty, I'd probably freak out and go to another room and maybe call like residential life and be like, my room's haunted, hon. We need to fix this. And while the late night moans and creaks echoing through the campus can be terrifying, at least students in this sleepy Massachusetts town have something to talk about the next day. Maybe we're more sensitive, more intuitive. I think that is definitely part of it. And we like to talk, and giggle, and scream. And at Mount Holyoke, telling stories is a way of keeping their rich tradition alive. And perhaps a way of accepting that at this school, the dead just might be walking among the living. It's exciting it in is a, a weird yeah. way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's kind of like a creepy movie. The original wheelchair is kept. Soon after she died, it was put away for storage. But some say Harriet's spirit is still attached. And the dark corners of the attic are where she roams. One night I was just sitting in my room with my roommate. And we heard like shuffling right above me actually. And I turned around to look at her. I was like, did you hear that? She's like, yeah. Trying to calm her nerves, she jokingly knocked on the ceiling as if to complain to her inconsiderate upstairs neighbors. But all laughing stopped when something from the empty attic above knocked back. And it wasn't an echo, like we've done it before, like I've done it since, I mean, and there's been no echo or anything, and so we've been really scared ever since, basically. There are other strange sounds coming from the empty attic that keep students from getting a good night's sleep. Around like three o'clock, um, you'll hear it go back and forth. Um, like you can hear the wheelchair going, moving. Um, like it sounds like wheels. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Sounds it? Like it sounds like wheels like strolling over, like just rolling down the aisle. Is the ghost of Harriet Huntress eternally making sure her stunder, Miss Mary Lyon? As a presence on campus, she is quite, uh, you know, present. She is absolutely here. Mary Lyon founded this school in 1837, and it, it was a labor of love. Mary Lyon was a huge advocate for women's higher education. And even today, all who say her name do so with a great appreciation of her efforts. But there was one person at Mount Holyoke who didn't share the admiration. Rumor has it that Mary Lyon and the school's religious clergyman, Deacon Porter, were having an illicit affair. Deacon Porter uh, was a good friend of Mary Lyon, and some would say perhaps too good of a friend. Today, a picture of the deacon's wife, Mrs. Hannah Porter, still hangs on campus. And some students swear the portrait is possessed. Hannah Porter's portrait is, in fact, um, very somber. 
and apparently the look she takes on during finals time um, is very disapproving. Uh, many students perceive this as her, her final vengeance against Mary Lyon for the affair she perceived between our founder and Deacon Porter. But a creepy painting isn't the only remnant of the past that comes alive at Mount Holyoke. Mary Lyon herself makes her presence known, the stories of the dead alive. Basically just chills me, you know, all through my body and like it was so scary. When I was up there, a couple of the lights were flickering. <laughs> it's just, it's really dark. It's very creepy. Of all the spirits rumored to be enrolled at Keene State, there is one that everyone knows about. Harriet Huntress. Harriet Huntress. Harriet Huntress. We just call her Harriet now. Like, we just kind of are like, oh, it's just Harriet. <laughs> the legend of Harriet Huntress dates back to the school's humble beginnings around the turn of the century. Harriet Huntress was, uh, was pretty special in the world of education. Uh, students were her focus. Uh, she uh, did whatever she could to make, uh, in particular, their quality of life better. Harriet worked for the Board of Education and was known as a devoted educator. She passionately fought for underprivileged students and raised funds so no student at Keene State College would be denied an education. The story goes that in 1918 she became afflicted with a mysterious illness and was bound to a wheelchair. But that didn't stop her tireless dedication to the school. Many say before she died, Harriet left a large sum of money to student scholarships. After her death... You'll hear it go back and forth. Um, like, you can hear the wheelchair going, moving. Um, like, it sounds like wheels. That's what it sounds like, doesn't it? Sounds it sounds like wheels like. strolling over, like, just rolling down the aisle. ghost of Harriet Huntress eternally making sure her students stay in line? I don't know, I, I, I guess it's, I guess Harriet's still around for some unfinished business, I guess. The Harriet story is very well known and I think that the, the stories aren't going to go away anytime soon. College students with uh, active young minds are fascinated by the unusual, whether they're uh, stories of aliens or ghosts or maybe just their science lessons. Could these active young minds be imagining the existence of Harriet? Or might her presence be one of those things that science cannot explain? While students at Keene State College have no scientific proof of a ghost, those who have seen her have no doubt she's there. Survive four years in a haunted college, and you'll leave school with more than just a diploma. All it takes is one extracurricular and killing off one by one. But even more disconcerting than how the books fell off the shelves is how they landed. The book usually lands like that. And if you try to do that by just pulling a book off of the shelf, especially from this height, it won't do it. You can't do it. It always falls over. Books aren't the only objects the ghost is reported to move at will. Before every Halloween, the librarians at Illinois State University bring tours into the haunted stacks. On this particular night, they got something else entirely, a genuine scare. A chair reserved for Angie's section of the stacks was seen quickly moving down the length of the aisle as if someone or something was moving it. If you try to roll the chair, give it a push, hardest push as you want, it always goes to the left. It won't ever go straight. But in this particular instance, it went all the way down the entire aisle. Recently, students doing a research paper on Angie's ghost brought a medium with them to try to contact her. And we found one spot, kind of in like the middle aisle, and we stood there and we were pretty sure that she was across from us. 
Stick around if you dare. New Hampshire is a postcard perfect New England town. But in Keene, things aren't always as they seem. Located in the southwest corner of the state, the city of Keene embodies small town living at its finest. It's like a quintessential New England town. The city is home to Keene State College. Much like the city itself, Keene State College is a friendly, tight-knit community. The campus is really nice because it's small enough, but it's big enough. You know everybody. Everybody knows everybody. It's kind of nice. A um, little over 5,000 kids. It's a good time. It really is. When they're not studying, Keene State students like to have a good time. Actually, Playboy called us the number one party school. Yeah. So, we're professional partiers. That's what Playboy called us. So. Our students have external influences on them for the first time, whether it's mom and dad not looking over their shoulders or new lives to lead. But our, our students are just like any other students anywhere else in the country. The students of Keene State College, however, might disagree. They say other students don't have to worry about pressures from the paranormal. I would say that there's some pretty restless spirits around campus. They're not really con... Legends of ghosts at Keene State College have passed from one generation of students to the next. But it's the first-hand experiences that keep the stories of the dead alive. Basically, just chills you know, all through my body, and like it was so scary. When I was up there, a couple of the lights were flickering. <laughs> it's just, it's really dark. It's very creepy. Of all the spirits rumored to be enrolled at Keene State, there is one that everyone knows about. Harriet Huntress. Harriet Huntress. Harriet Huntress. We just call her Harriet now. Like, we just kind of are like, oh, it's just Harriet. <laughs> the legend of Harriet Huntress dates back to the school's humble beginnings around the turn of the century. Harriet Huntress was, uh, was pretty special in the world of education. Uh, students were her focus. Uh, she uh, did whatever she could to make, uh, in particular, their quality of life better. Harriet worked for the Board of Education and was known as a devoted educator. She passionately fought for underprivileged students and raised funds so no student at Keene State College would be denied an education. The story goes that in 1918 stories at Mount Holyoke, it is hard to tell which ones are based in truth and which ones are just urban legend. But there's one ghost that even skeptical students can't deny. She's a foggy form roaming the fourth floor. Students believe this spirit is that of a former student who killed herself in a room after she was stood up by a boy. Today, the room where she hung herself is off limits to all. For a long time, it was reported that students who were rooming in the, the room had their legs broken routinely. Fact or fiction, no one wanted to take a chance. The room was boarded up. But when a housing crisis hit the college in the 80s, the dean contemplated reopening the room. But only after staying the night in it herself to prove the rumors were nothing more than urban legend. So she attempted to spend the night there to disprove the myth to the Mount Holyoke students because nobody was, wanted to live there. And um, as the story goes, she left in the middle of the night um, raving, seal it, seal it, rip down the walls. No one knows exactly what happened that night. The dean never uttered a word. I'm sure you've heard the room in Wilder is close it off. So it still is closed off. I mean, maybe there's a problem. But it seems like at Mount Holyoke, when one room is boarded up, no parents, no curfews, the perfect chance to try something new. But on a haunted campus, an encounter with the unknown can turn ghostly and will send you running scared right back to mom and dad. Welcome to Sarasota, Florida, home of warm beaches, bikinis, and the circus. Believe it or not, the vacation destination of Sarasota owes much of its history to the Ringling Brothers Circus. 
But it's another Ringling building whose history is far more bizarre than the Big Top. Ringling School of Art and Design attracts an eclectic mix of art students. These creative types can major in computer animation, graphic and web design, illustration, photography, and much more. But you won't find hauntings listed in the course book. It seems at Ringling, ghost sightings are strictly extracurricular. You see a skeletal figure floating in the air above you, that's pretty scary. I didn't believe it until I saw that, saw her that night. It's kind of a, an eye-catching experience and a life-changing experience. Ringling's resident ghost dates back to the 1920s. Students call her Mary, and many believe life wasn't kind to this depressed and aging prostitute. That's actually a picture I took in the hallway.